Uh, we shall begin now. Hi, everyone. My name is Rehan, uh, Head of Partnerships and Marketing at Fintech Australia. And welcome to this, uh, to this panel discussion on how to manage credit in a downturn um, in partnership with AWS. David Fodor, who is um, Financial Services Business Development Manager, will be moderating the panel. And yeah, um, over to you, David, to begin. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for the introduction and uh, welcome everyone today for what I expect to be a really interesting discussion. Um, we've put together a, a great panel of um, speakers from across the industry, those who've been working in and around the credit risk management space for some time. Um, it's, it's fair to say that there's um, uh, the time we're in at the moment is, is fairly unprecedented and if we look back in history to uh, other events to compare to, I'd say in our lifetime, uh, our living memory for sure, um, the, the, the experience we're having today is un, uh, unheard of. So, so today we're going to talk about um, lessons from previous economic disruptions and downturns and things that have been learned over time and how we can take those and importantly apply them to situations such as we're uh, experiencing today. So firstly, and importantly to introduce our panel, I'm actually gonna let the panelists introduce themselves and in the, in the course of introducing themselves, give a little bit of background about themselves and the organization that they come from and their um, particular experience with um, management of, of risk. So Jackie, I'll start with you. Jackie Colwell from um, the, the Chief Risk Officer of uh, Judo Bank. Hi, thanks David. Um, so yeah, Chief Risk Officer of Judo Bank. Um, I've had 30 plus years in financial services, um, over a third of which has been in risk management, um, including across the whole spectrum, both business and corporate um, lending, as well as retail and consumer lending. Um, I was previously um, the Chief Risk Officer of NAB's Personal Banking Division, um, and I left that um, to join a startup um, and get what was then when I we started with Judo Capital um, with a desire to become Australia's first SME challenger, challenger bank. Um, so I've been here over three years, um, always as the CRO and working out how you, um, how, how you do this when you start from a, start from nothing and you start from a bank, play, bank blank sheet of paper, build a bank um, and um, go into um, probably one, what some would consider um, a different area being SME lending. Great. Thanks, Jack. Um, maybe over to you, Joanne, from uh, WISER. Joanne Edwards, the, the Chief Risk Officer of, of WISER. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, so I've um, only recently joined WISER. Um, I joined um, in January. Uh, prior to that, um, I worked at the Commonwealth Bank for the past 10 years. Um, always in the credit risk area, um, pretty much did every job um, in every different team in that, um, in the unsecured lending space. Um, my final role was actually leading the unsecured team in the consumer finance business. So looking after credit cards, personal loans. Um, yeah, and prior to that, I'm originally from the UK and I worked at GE Capital, again, in the credit risk area. So I think I'm counting 18 years now um, of experience within credit risk. Nice. Great to have you on board today. Thanks. Thanks, Joanne. Uh, Mr. Hendricks, Michael Hendricks, the uh, newly appointed Chief Risk Officer of Revolut. Welcome. Thanks, David. Uh, thanks, uh, everyone. Uh, hello. Yeah, I'm, uh, I have a very uh, long background in uh, retail banking, um, over 25 years. I uh, also did a stint at NAB uh, back in the day, Jackie. Um, uh, I also uh, spent a lot of time at Citibank. Uh, and through uh, both of those companies, I was actually able to get some exposure uh, in international markets as well. So David and I uh, did an expat uh, assignment that crossed over in Leeds, where I helped build a risk management function there for the credit card business in the UK, which was a fantastic experience. Uh, helped build the credit um, uh, business for uh, the credit card uh, for Citibank in Australia as well, and some exposure across Asia and Pacific. So, uh, Asia Pacific. So. Um, yeah, so, so pretty deep retail banking experience with uh, credit risk and also uh, analytics as well. Started at Revolut in uh, January uh, to help uh, build that business out here in, uh, in Australia. So uh, moving from traditional banking into a fintech, um, yes, uh, Jackie, it can be a bit of a uh, culture shock indeed. 
but uh, it's all good fun. Great, thanks, Michael. And last but by no means least, uh, Tim Brinkler, the G general manager of Credit Risk at uh, Latitude Financial Services. Thanks, David, and uh, morning all. Yep, fellow POM, and similarly been around uh, the credit risk industry longer than I care to uh, think about. Um, originated, uh, I guess you'd call it now a fintech, um, little company called CCN Systems in Nottingham back in the sort of mid late 80s, which became uh, Experian. Um, and that's actually what uh, brought me to Australia. So I was there for, for 10 years, uh, sort of seat of the pants stuff, while that company was growing very, very uh, rapidly. And uh, since then, I've completed the uh, the Melbourne circuit. I was at NAB for uh, 10 years. I was at ANZ, uh, joined GE, and obviously been through the whole uh, divestment from GE uh, to Latitude, which uh, we're now a sort of private, uh, private equity-owned uh, private company. Great. Thank you, Tim. So welcome to the panel um, and to the audience as we go through the discussion over the course of the next 50 odd minutes. Um, please participate by dropping any questions that you might have for the panel into the Q&A section. I will do that my best as uh, we go along through the discussion to weave in any questions that you want to put forward to the panel um, as we go. So let's get cracking. Um, and I'm going to start Back with you, Jackie. Um, I read very early this morning um, the article in the Fin Review about uh, Judo Bank. Um, congratulations on your new terminology. You are now being uh, called a unicorn, so congratulations on that auspicious tag. Um, tell us a little bit about the secret of how you've managed to raise new equity and considerable equity um, in such a time of, of um, you know, global disruption. Tell us a little bit, bit about that process. And you're on mute, Jack. Oh, you're back on mute. You're back on mute. There we go. Thanks, thanks, David. Um, look, um, firstly, I'd say a lot of a lot of hard work, um, but a lot of it's been about building relationships over a number of years from when we first started this process, um, and always making sure that we got the right investors on board with us that really believed in what what judo was was trying to do and um you know they really had to have a belief in in us um and i suppose then delivering on what we said we were going to do so this last round of capital that we've raised was all from our existing investors um given the changes that occurred when we first um, not long after we first went out with with this round um, we decided to close it to to new investors um, just given the volatility in in capital markets at the at the moment, so um, it's been great um, to see a response um, from our existing inv existing investor pool, um, and you know support from them, I suppose, for the local SME community in Australia um, during what's a really difficult difficult period for them. Um, so to to give us that capital, which you know continues to enable our growth. And while I'm with you, Jackie, um, you've obviously had a lot of experience managing risk across all the dimensions and, and particularly credit risk, um, both with a T1 bank and now with um, a startup or a digital neobank. Um, can you describe your experience, the differences, the challenges, um, the trade-offs? What's been your experience to date with, um, with Judo versus a, a T1? Look, in many ways, there's not a lot of differences. You know, managing risk is much the same, whether it's, um, you know, a portfolio in a large bank or um, from, from a startup. You're still looking for the same type of things. You're still checking you're not building portfolio concentrations. You're still looking at your delinquency rates. Um, all, of those, all of those things. I think the hardest thing um, is around models. You don't necessarily have the models to support you and the analytics that you, you do in a larger bank. So you have to be much more hands-on. Um, you know, we use a lot of models that you would call expert judgment models because it takes you some time to build the data that you need to be able to build out your own models. Um, and in the SME space is a little bit different to the consumer space in that it's much more data inefficient. So to get that publicly available data or alternate sources of data to use um, in the SME space. It just takes a lot, a lot longer to get there. Um, so that's that's probably the big differentiator um, that 
from being in a, a larger bank to a, to a smaller bank, um, and probably um, the sophistication of your risk management systems that you have in, have in place. And as both sides of your balance sheet grow, and, and they, they're growing quite materially, um, Jack, in, in that context, do you find um, a particular posture from the regulator or to, to accelerate development of, of models and model management? Um, look, I think the regulator's been really good in terms of the new entrants coming onto the market and understanding that it takes time to get these things things right. Look, we, we've built a, a credit risk engine, which I think, um, you know, which automates our RWA calculations every month. And, you know, I think to get to that stage, um, and, you know, we've had that operating for over six months now. Um, you know, we got that operating probably six months after licensing. Um, so I think so long as the progression continues, um, you know, and that we we manage within the frameworks that we've set, they're, they're reasonably comfortable. Okay, great. Joanne, I'll, I'll turn to you. Um, same question, given you've had a similar experience, you've come from a tier one bank and now um, managing risk at a, at a startup. H how have you experienced the differences, if any? Yeah, look, I, I would tend to agree with Jackie that actually all the aspects of credit risk that you have to manage are the same um, and you have to still look at everything across that life cycle, even if the portfolio is smaller. Um, and I think, um, you know, however, there is some kind of key differences really just in terms of operating model that I've noticed um, since I've been there. And that's really around, I suppose, the kind of agility and ability to make changes quickly um, that I've, I've seen at Wiser. Um, and I think that's just because we have to. Um, and we've been able to, because we're a smaller team as well, we've been able to kind of multi-skill our people quite quickly. And um, so almost overnight, you can, you know, you can train the loan pro processing team to start taking calls to deal with customers' requests for financial assistance. So just, you know, the, the sheer ability of how quickly we can, we can move. Um, and also, you know, just in terms of, say, implementing credit policy, we can be a lot more um, detailed and specific because we do still rely on um, like an underwriting as well as the automation that you can actually quickly change a credit officer to look at something that you probably couldn't do as quickly within a fully data-driven modeling environment. And, and do you feel that the tools and techniques that you have available to you as part of Wiser are similar or different to, to when you were at, a, at a, a large bank? And I think in terms of the system capability is actually quite similar just in terms of the, like, the way that we process the decisioning um, but, but um, you know, the analytical capability is something that I'm definitely interested in, in developing and that's an area of opportunity. Um, you know, I had a team of 80 analysts, so obviously I don't have that um, at Wiser and that's something that, yeah, to Jackie's point, you have to get quite a lot more hands-on um, than I did in the past. So enjoying kind of getting back to the grassroots of, of that kind of looking at the data and, and using that to make decisions and drive change. Okay, great. Michael, I'll turn to you. Um, you may want to just spend a minute to introduce Revolut to the audience, given it's a, a fairly new presence in the market. And then I'm interested in understanding how Revolut thinks about risk management um, in the context of global versus local, particularly at a time, you know, like, like we're experiencing at the moment and whether that changes your approach to entering a new market. So I'll just hand over to you for a, a bit of an intro in the first instance. Thanks, David. Yeah, yeah Re Revolut started about five years ago. Um, and saw a, a real opportunity in the market where traditional uh, banks and service providers were uh, charging quite high margins on, uh, on FX for, for consumers when they were, particularly when they were doing their travel. So basically launched a, an app and a, and a debit card to attack that, that space with a, a travel card product uh, where we commit to give you as close to the real uh, FX rate as possible and no fees and really started from there. And the thing that came out from that was it really resonated with a part of the market in the, in the UK and people really gravitated towards it. And so we've been building out extra features against that uh, ever since then. Uh, where our product is much more mature in the UK and Europe, we are now up to over 10 million customers um, uh, over there. And we provide a whole broad range of services via the app. Um, even right at the edges, we actually offer some crypto, some trading, um, some some uh, innovative savings solutions. So we really are on a path to create what we call a global 
uh, financial super app uh, and really take that capability globally. Uh, Australia was identified as uh, an attractive market. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a well, it's a wealthy market. It's a, it's, a, it's a really sophisticated banking market and very similar regulatory regime to the home uh, country in, in the UK. Uh, and so we've been uh, building the capability here. Uh, we started off under an exemption uh, with ASIC and we've been working through the process uh, to uh, get up and running fully. And hopefully we're not too far away from doing that and being able to bring all those great features that everybody loves in the UK and Europe uh, to Australia. And, and how's the, what's the perspective at the moment on, on risk and risk uh, appetite in different markets? Yeah, so Is it a consistent there's, view? there are two components there really. Um, more, if you, the nature of our product, the, the, the sort of biggest inherent risk is, is around AML. Uh, and so we've significantly invested in, in that area. Uh, and being a, a company that is a technology company at its heart, uh, the ability to uh, build bespoke capability to manage that has been quite impressive and strong and, and also get some global scale as well. As we've expanded very rapidly, both in Europe and now globally and with the feature set, operational risk is a real focus for us for rapid technology change and how that translates into a marketplace and meeting our obligations uh, around that. Uh, from a global perspective and, and with what's happening, uh, clearly, um, you know, we've been impacted with a lot of other companies with the, the, the uh, quarantine and no travel. And so we've really had to review our business in the context of, of that strategic risk to our business. And we've been working through that process. Okay. Fantastic. Thanks, Michael. Tim, um, Latitude is uh, currently a, a private equity business, was formerly um, GE Capital. Um, how have you seen the difference, if any, um, in terms of risk appetite and the management of credit risk between those two ownership models? Yes, yeah, people are probably aware the, the sort of GFC impacted quite significantly on uh, GE's consumer finance business in particular. Um, so, you know, at the time I came in and, and part of the reason I was brought in is because of some of the experience I'd had previously with dealing with regulators. Uh, but naturally, you know, GE wasn't investing heavily in that business. There was a lot of oversight from uh, corporate HQ as well as, well as uh, a lot of oversight from the Federal Reserve. So, um, you know, the business was very constrained. Uh, it wasn't being invested in. Uh, and it was quite frustrating because uh, a lot of time was being dealt less in the business and actually doing the kind of exciting things and helping the business to grow and, and evolve and more around uh, you know, sort of compliance and regulatory requirements. Um, obviously, dramatic change since um, private equity ownership. Uh, you, uh, there is only one priority, and that's this business and consumer finance. So um, very focused on that. Um, it's an uh, yeah, interesting experience going from... Uh, having that sort of oversight from corporate office and uh, to basically you're it. So from an accountability perspective, uh, you know, if you're looking after risk, buck stops with you, what are you going to do about it? You know, get on and do it. So, um, uh, and that's great. You know, so it's, a, it's more dynamic and I guess an aspiration for us uh, is to try and um, exploit that sweet spot of both having a, an organization which is already at scale and we have the, you know, the breadth and depth of customer base and, and data, et cetera. Uh, whilst also being uh, you know, nimble like a fintech uh, and able to, to move uh, very quickly. Um, that investment side of things as well. So, uh, you know, preparedness to invest for the, the medium term, not, not just the, the short term or, or in fact not at all. Um, and then, um, as I think Jackie was saying, uh, you've got to roll your sleeves up. And Joanne, you know, roll your sleeves up. There's nowhere to hide. You, uh, whatever level you are, you're just a bunch of folks uh, uh, getting the job done and uh, uh, less silo. So you've got to get involved in the whole breadth across the business, be it you know, funding and treasury, uh, where obviously the credit risk is a, is a very key aspect to that, or you know, reserving and capital, as well as the kind of day-to-day -day, uh, credit strategy work. Um, and probably the last one I'd say is a lot more exposure to board. Um, so that's a, a rhythm that um, I'm certainly heavily involved with as well. Myself off of you. Uh, thanks, man. Um, so I'm going to get us focused now on you know the, the the core topic of the conversations about you know managing risk in a downturn. If I cast my mind back to 
um, the most recent significant uh, macroeconomic shock we had um, going back to the late 2000s, the GFC triggered by the subprime lending um, crisis in the US and, and then the liquidity crisis that that, that then um, created across global equity, uh, liquidity markets. Um, I had the fortune or the misfortune of, of being a risk manager um, in, in the retail banking space at that time. And I, I distinctly remember uh, the challenges throughout the credit life cycle, whether it be you know, through the door or, or at the back end. Um, a question to the panel, but I'll start with Jackie in the first instance. Jackie, from your experience um, at that time and um, remembering the impacts on, on the customers that you dealt with, um, what have you learned? What experience have you brought forward and, and how are you applying them to, to what we're um, experiencing today? Yeah, thanks, David. Um, so actually during the GFC, um, I was also in risk at, at that time and um, I was um, the head of risk in um, for business banking credit risk. Um, and it was an interesting time because of exposures to property, in um, particularly in tourism areas um, and the changes that happened as, as a result. And I think one of the big things we saw was, you know, the cost of capital and, um, and the changes that, that occurred there. I, I think one of the biggest learnings for me was around those portfolio concentrations. Um, and, may, and, and it's something that always sticks with me that um, it, it's always good to, you know, start to become an expert or build up a specialisation in an area, but in periods of downturn, um, your losses can be greater because you've built up that level of specialisation. Um, so that's, that's certainly a big one for me is those portfolio concentrations, but also from a balance sheet perspective, making sure your level of capital and your liquidity, um, that you've done enough stress testing on it, you know, no matter how bad those scenarios look and everyone goes, oh, that, that's never going to happen. Um, I don't think anyone predicted a, a global pandemic and the impacts, you know, of total business shutdown. Um, so I think just making sure you've always stressed your portfolios um, and that you're holding enough capital and liquidity. And Joanne, what about um, in, in your circumstance? Yeah, I was um, back in the UK um, that, at that time working at GE. Uh, the nature of that business um, was really in the store financing and the buy now, pay later segment. And it was probably, to, they would describe themselves as being lower prime or subprime. Um, so we're hit quite early with regards to rising losses. Um, also what happened was, um, because, uh, and I think Tim, Tim mentioned some of this previously, is that the kind of global GE headquarters out of the US were quite impacted by what was going on in the kind of mortgage prime markets. So capital was quite restricted to us um, pretty quickly, which meant that we couldn't really invest in new business models anymore to kind of change our business and evolve from where we were, uh, which ultimately led to um, GE kind of backing out the UK market and selling what was um, at the kind of consumer lending business to Santander. Um, but at, during that time, I was working in the collection strategy area. So we were hit quite rapidly with the kind of losses um, that, you know, you're in those conversations with, with kind of your, your execs and, and you're basically saying, look, my prediction is the losses are going to be triple what they were last year and no one really believes you and you have to try and justify um, the analysis to prove that. Um, yeah, so, you know, it was just very much a very analytical, very data-driven, um, cutting the data in lots of different ways to prove um, what you thought you were going to see, um, and lots of questions and scrutiny um, on that. Um, so a real good learning for me at the time. Um, but yeah, like that, I left that business um, yeah, in 2008, and that's when I came to Australia. So, yeah. Mike, I know you guys aren't uh, lenders in the market uh, today, but what what um, what have you seen as as the way in which uh, credit risk has changed or not um, over the course of the last ten years, and how are we taking that into the current environment? Yeah, well, during the GFC, I, I was at Citibank, and uh, you know it was a, a a great learning experience then because we got to see what was happening in the home market in the US. Uh, what was happening here in Australia, which was fundamentally different, um, and then also exposure across across Asia. 
And, and working at City across the 12 retail markets in Asia, we actually, we actually had a credit crisis in one country every year. You know, whether it was the Taiwan credit crisis or something in the Philippines we had one year, the Korean credit crisis. So what, what that really meant was that when, when, when the crisis hit at the time, and the thing that I remember the most is that the response is to be strategic. It's very easy to make quick knee-jerk reactions, um, but take a step back and be, be strategic in the first instance of what you wanted to do. So certainly the home market in the US was catastrophic, what happened through that. But in Australia, it was very much fundamentally more of a liquidity event. And we saw liquidity premium skyrocket and that created a challenge around what to do with pricing. Do you purely absorb it? Do you pass it fully on? Do you split it up? And what does that mean for your business around that? Uh, and, and the key thing that, that we did out of that was, and Cities are a very data-driven organisation, was we, we did a lot of it, uh, analysis to separate the portfolio into tiers and segments of sort of, you know, good, medium and bad and had segmented strategies against each of those based on the strategic response. And I think that what's happened um, in the last 10 years since that crisis is that there's much more data available, much more analytical tools that are available. So people should be able to do that drill down, develop those uh, strategies and actions and respond far faster than, than we did back then and do that. But the core lesson uh, out of that really is don't panic, be strategic in your response, think through what you're doing because you might be making some very short-term decisions that could, could harm you uh, down the track. Hi all, um, I, I just wanted to say hello on behalf of FinTech Australia and thank you all for participating in the webinar today. I know AWS put this together but I just wanted to jump online quickly and say thank you of you prior to starting. Um, I will be listening in the background, but um, I will turn my webcam off um, while you guys are all talking. Thanks, Rebecca. Good to see you. Um, also, just quickly, Michael, I love your Collingwood jumper in the background. It's great. <laughs> Couldn't I was waiting for someone to comment on that. I got sledged on that through the run through. <laughs> <laughs> Tim, Tim I'll, I'll go to you. Um, you know, you've, uh, over the course of the last 10 years, moved from a, you know, a credit risk management um, context in a, in a large bank to um, a, a smaller, relatively smaller lender. Have you seen the way you need to invest time and energy as you go through what's happening now differ to what happened 10 years ago through the GFC? I mean, you benefit from being uh, so solely focused on consumer finance. Um, and I think the uh, impact of downturns is often misunderstood across the different portfolios. So if you look at the uh, you know, degree of variability for, uh, let's say, a typical credit card portfolio compared to perhaps corporate, commercial, business lending, home lending, um, you've got much more diversity um, across your, your risks, um, you know, spread across a multitude of customers. Um, so you kind of unexpected loss relative to your expected loss. You don't get that degree of divergence, plus your uh, management actions are, are quite uh, impactful as well, uh, the actions that you can take. Um, so that piece around um, being given the accountability uh, to, to get on and do stuff quickly. And certainly as you go into these kind of crises, you know, numbers geeks like me, you like to be able to prove things out with data. Uh, it's no good waiting 12 months and once you've got the data and realizing you should have done something different 12 months ago. So um, it's probably a period where uh, the credit risk specialists are a little bit uncomfortable because you really, it becomes artless, less science and you've got to rely on your instincts, experience uh, to make some calls um, before it's necessarily proven out in the data. Uh, I've kind of had enough grey hairs now that have been around in the sort of 90s, 91 recession as well uh, and seen that uh, go around. Um, I mean, a couple of key things that stand out for me, um, a lot of people or a lot of customers are actually trying to do the right thing. And in the end, the GFC was relatively benign in Australia, certainly on the consumer portfolios. And, and in fact, the government handouts were... Um, largely used quite responsibly by customers, and I think that was a, a mitigant. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm quite hopeful that uh, that will be repeated 
uh, with this downturn. Um, one I particularly recall from the, um, not the GFC, but the recession in the early 90s, um, it was pretty stark that a lot of your consumer customers are actually small businesses. So I uh, remember uh, I was more on the consulting side then, but seeing a couple of card, you know, premium card portfolios blow up, which had been you know, perfectly good customers, very uh, high profile portfolios, but they were uh, being used to try and sort of salvage um, small businesses that were in difficulty. Um, and another very interesting one, um, a lot of conference fodder in the past was around uh, limits management and dropping limits to try and mitigate exposure. Um, for credit card portfolios, it doesn't work very well, actually. Because um, if you do apply those sort of broad brush approaches, you end up upsetting people more than uh, you benefit yourself. And uh, even if it is a, perhaps a, someone who's um, under financial distress and they're choosing who they pay first, you drop the limit, they'll probably put you down the bottom of the, of the pecking order. Um, so I think there's a bit of a lesson learned in terms of um, limit match management strategies um, as well. And probably the final point uh, I would make is around the importance of keeping paying, both from a lender and a, a consumer perspective. And what I don't mean paying in full, um, but just that rhythm, even if you can pay a small amount, I think it's often uh, in the best interest of, of consumers as well, rather than paying nothing. Um, so I think part of, uh, I'm sure, a concern we've all got with what we're facing into is obviously there's impacts here and now um, but with government subsidies and payment holidays, what happens when they run out and um, what situation will people be in? You know, potentially you may have people in six months' time who uh, both have to start paying, repaying on, on mortgages and other debts uh, and also perhaps run out of some of the, uh, the government support and they're still not back in, in full employment or employment at all. So <clears throat> I think that's going to be interesting to, to manage through as well. Yeah, it, I, I guess, you know, there's a number of blunt instrument uh, approaches being applied to the market at the moment, whether it's, you know, um, repayment holidays or minimisation of um, uh, payments made to credit cards and the like. So um, that provides some structural longer term issues that we need to, to think about. I'm going to bring in the audience questions in one sec, but I just want to um, get your perspectives, your respective perspectives of how your attitudes um, your thinking and importantly, your organization's um, risk appetite has evolved over the last two or three months as the current crisis has, has, has wound out. Um, so so maybe, back, back, maybe back to the start, back to you, Jack. Um, give us a sense of how your thinking's changed and, and whether that's changed explicitly that the strategies that you were employing two months ago versus now. Yeah, so look, in many ways, um, our risk appetite hasn't changed. Um, early on when this happened, we formed what you would call a judo house view, um, collecting as much information as we could and, and, you know, making our own assessment of how long we thought this might take to play out, um, you know, what, what unemployment might go to, what might happen to GDP, to try and, try and inform that view around risk appetite. And when we looked at what we do and how we do it at Judo, which is very much judgment-based lending, really focused on, you know, the basics of credit assessment and the four Cs, we felt we had the right structures already in place to be able to manage through this. Also, one of the benefits of being a small bank with a smaller portfolio is we, we did a file-by-file -file review of every, every customer that, that we have. We reached out to the customers, spoke to them to understand how they were impacted, what support that they needed, how we could help them, um, which is a lot easier when you're in a small bank than in a large bank that have had to, as you said, put blunt instruments in place. We've been able to be much more bespoke in our response. I think what's changed between when this probably first hit us in March, you know, to now almost two months on, is looking actually at the resilience within the portfolio and, and in a lot of our SME customers. If I look back to where we were GFC to where we are now, um, businesses are actually much better capitalised and much stronger than they were back then because they've had a period of really low um, interest rates for a number of years. So they've been able to preserve a lot of capital and that, and whether that's been reinvested in their business. So they're a lot a lot stronger than they were than I think pre-GFC. 
Um, so I think we've started to moderate our our um, view a little bit during that time. And, we, you know, we're certainly starting to see some green shoots, which, which supports that. Um, you know, certainly we've adjusted our provisioning levels, um, you know, and put, put some extra overlays in place at the end of March, because, you know, no doubt there will, that things have changed, the environment has changed. But in terms of actually risk appetite, industries that we look at, or um, how we assess credit um, hasn't really changed, but we're, I think, placing a lot more emphasis on looking at, in the assessment process, how those industries have been impacted, how businesses are managing through that, and what's the capital in their balance sheet to help them, um, and what duration can they, can they manage through. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, Jackie. Joanne, I'll go to you. Um, similar question, um, but probably in the context of Wiser as a, a lender who, you know, you're all about helping your customers pay down debt faster. Um, how does how does that work in today's climate? Does it change? Does it, you know, do you maintain the course? How, how do you go about managing that situation? Yeah, look, uh, and I think this is a real good time for Wiser to leverage the kind of ecosystem that we've built. So, you know, we have the, the app that actually lets you um, connect your transaction account to any um, debt that you have um, and you and kind of round up those transactions to pay off that, that, that debt quicker. And we now have 80,000 customers on that application. Um, and again, with our Wiser credit solution, which is actually you can go on to register for Wiser credit and understand your credit scores um, and your credit files from two of the credit bureaus. So actually get that information more regularly. So I think this time gives us a kind of unique opportunity to really appeal to some of those different types of financial wellness tools that we've developed. Um, just in terms of the loan um, portfolio to add to that, and again, I, I would agree with Jackie, our risk appetite hasn't changed. Um, we're, we're quite conservative um, and a prime lender and always aim to lend to, um, to kind of a, a lower risk segment. And you can see that through some of our average credit scores that we when we look at our bureau scores compared to the market um, so i think we're pretty well placed um, our focus really has been you know wanting to continue to lend but really focusing on how we can make more reasonable inquiries um, with with those borrowers in certain segments um, where they could be more exposed to um, to kind of impact due to you know the business no longer operating um, so we could quite quickly change our lending processes to ask more questions, um, to introduce kind of employer call outs where we maybe didn't do that as much before. Um, so yeah, we, we've been quite quickly able to add some of those um, changes. And really now we're focusing on that kind of segment that um, has requested assistance. Um, and that's been quite an interesting experience because we kind of had this peak of, of customers requesting assistance, but now we've seen that plateau and actually we've seen some of these those customers saying actually they want to continue to pay because some of the government stimulus has has kicked in and we've been quite careful in explaining you know if you do take that <coughs> payment pause what does that actually mean um you know it means interest still accrues so we've been quite careful with describing what those payment pauses mean to customers um so that they can make an informed choice before kind of getting into one of those those arrangements Great, thank you, Joanne. Um, before I get on to the massive backlog of audience questions, which I am determined to address, not all of them, but um, certainly a, a selection. Um, Mike, has the current situation um, changed Revolut's plans to, to uh, enter the market at all, or is business as usual? Oh, no, it's not business as usual. Uh, I mean, you know, our revenues have taken a hit because people have stopped traveling. Um, I think it's an interesting question when people talk about risk appetite. I mean, right now is probably not the right time to worry so much about adjusting your risk appetite. You need to worry about what's happening within your portfolio. Um, and, and so we've taken, you know, a long, hard look at our costs uh, and where they are being generated and what we can do about that, but done it in the context still of what our overall strategy is. So since, you know, COVID uh, has hit and, and, and had an impact across the business, uh, we've gone public in the US launched there. We've launched a, a junior account in the, in the UK, which has proven extremely popular. And just last week we announced, you know, we rolled out our banking license in Europe, started in, in uh, Lithuania. So it's really important to balance the actions you take right now 
uh, in the context of, you know, where you see your business still being. Um, I keep coming back to that point, right? You can make, you can take some actions now that can really hurt your business in the long run. Um, you know, from, from a credit perspective, I can only back up what Tim was saying earlier. You know, when, when, uh, with the portfolios we managed at, at City, by taking a segmented approach, we actually ring fenced, we used credit scores and behavior scores and ring fenced the pool of our customers. And we made the commitment that we would continue to manage those customers as if nothing had happened. We allowed them to spend um, we gave them line increases if they asked, because we took the, the bet that they were good. And then we, that allowed us to focus our attention and energy on parts of the portfolio that really needed uh, the, um, the, the harsher action and the harder work. And what that meant was, is, as, as the market normalized, uh, the company had a pool of extremely strong, loyal, profitable customers that could help the business grow forward. Um, and so that was, uh, you know, a, a really great approach that, that, that we took at that time. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Tim, um, any change from a latitude perspective? I know you've been, you know, been in and around IPO land for a while. Um, anything you can tell us about the impact of that today versus forward plans? Yeah, obviously, uh, you know, GE's got a um, very long heritage in, in risk management. So, uh, you know, we apply a lot of rigor to uh, understanding the dynamic between uh, risk, appetite, returns, pricing limits, um, and we're constantly, and we, you know, we have the benefit of reasonably sizable portfolios to, to sort of constantly refine and, and, and challenge that. Um, I guess the unknown is what will that risk look like? So, um, you know, we still put a heavy weight because um, we know the scorecards will continue to discriminate, but what they will do is they will deteriorate in terms of their uh, calibration. Um, so when we're looking to make adjustments, we're actually you know, stressing that calibration and making certain assumptions about what that means. Um, uh, so just picking up on Michael's point, um, again, there's a bit of misconception around particularly card portfolios, because you think about the two portfolios very differently. So a personal loan portfolio, what the business you're writing right now, uh, will quickly become your portfolio. And so that's um, risk appetite in terms of um, new originations is, is critical. For cards, particularly if volumes are down in a stressed environment, what you're adding to your portfolio in the next 12 plus months is fairly immaterial compared to the back book. So um, how you're managing cards, it's less about the risk appetite of what you're booking going forwards, but it's the, uh, the, the actions you're taking to try and um, manage your, your back book. Um, so yeah, not, not a huge uh, change in, on risk appetite. I think what everyone's struggling with uh, a little bit is just how will this play out? So, uh, you know, we're cutting stress tests and scenarios every which way, and even the economists, their views are changing on a, on a daily basis as to, you know, how quickly will unemployment peak? What will the peak be? What will the overhang be? Um, so running a whole range of different uh, scenarios and, and stress tests to, to try and understand that. Um, and the last point that which um, Jackie touched on is uh, reserves. So uh, obviously a lot of focus on that. What's an appropriate um, balance sheet to, to book up uh, to uh, cover what we uh, expect the losses will be going forwards. Um, and again, that's uh, part, part art, part, part science because every downturn is different. Even if you've got empirical data from the past, this one's very unique and, and very different. Um, so uh, we're spending a fair bit of time uh, contemplating that and, and debating that with our board as well. Uh, and probably the final piece to throw in from a risk appetite perspective, um, there's the whole regulatory, so it's not purely a credit risk lens that you've got to apply to this, and particularly mindful of the um, you know, regulatory guidance around responsible lending. Um, so you can't apply a rear view mirror, uh, particularly when we've got some of these vulnerable groups like you know, casuals and, and small businesses, when is there a reasonable expectation <laughs> that their income may change going forward. So uh, just reflecting on that and the approach that you take to that and, and I guess what your risk appetite or to what extent do you want to um, ask more questions of, of those particular groups. Um, so yeah, that's uh, top of mind for us. Yeah, great. Thank you, Tim. All right, I'm going to do my best to channel the audience in the remaining 13 minutes we've got left. So. I'll do my best to curate the, the questions that we had pre-submitted plus what's come through on the, on the chat and Q&A. So I'm going to give Andrew Stabick from Unify first crack as he both pre-submitted and has um, asked a couple of questions 
through the chat. I think this one's directed to Jackie. So Jackie, given that all of the credit pricing signals and benchmarks have been smashed by volatility and government intervention, for good or bad, how do you effectively price for risk now? Jackie, you're sorry, just getting myself off mute. Um, yeah, thanks, David and Andrew. Good, good question. Um, look, I think it's something that when you're a, a small organisation starting starting up, you have to have your pricing for risk mechanics set up. Um, appropriately in the first place. I think the approach that we take, because it is judgment-based um, and do, um, you know, we're less reliance on scorecards for, for that outcome, we can shift um, our ability to price for risk in terms of new originations coming in now. Um, it, it, you know, it's a very different situation to risk that we originated six, six or nine, nine months ago. Um, and because it is, you know, each individual customer, each individual facility is assessed, we're able to um, understand the risk in the current market. The way we rate our customers from a risk perspective, you know, when I spoke before about models, it, it is probably one of our better models in terms of understanding that. The challenge you have right now is you cannot rely on historical data um, to adequately assess that assess that risk, because is in this environment, historical data is is not irrelevant, um, but you have to be able to look beyond beyond that and through this current cycle um, to look at to appropriately assess the risk. So related to that, um, Jackie, uh, there's a, a separate question, but I think it it links in quite nicely, given the limitations of the data that, that has been used historically and, and that is flowing around at the moment. Um, how, how important is manual assessment and expert judgment in, in, the, in the process of underwriting today? Um, it's more critical, more critical than ever. And really, you know, understanding who you're lending to, what their experience is, what the strength of their balance sheet. But you also said have to have some house view and understanding of some of these industries which will come out of this quicker because they're not all going to come out of this situation at the same time um, and all may have different needs as they start to start to come through that. We developed a tool to help us um, with the government guarantee loan and assess what actually was the cash flow need that the customer would need during this situation. Not, not perfect, but certainly a good indicator to help us understand some of that, um, some of that risk. Okay, thanks, Jackie. Great, great insights. Um, this one's probably best for. I'll, I'll throw it to Joanne and, and Tim. Um, how are panelists approaching their debt collection practices in a COVID environment? That's from Lachlan Hilsler. Yeah, I can uh, start there. So, um, I think the difference for for debt collection here is actually the issue isn't people missing payments for us, but the issue is a lot of people have seeked payment assistance or seek to an arrangement or a payment pause. That's the difference. So in terms of our kind of business as usual collections activity, that hasn't changed. And, and my view is our data at this stage is saying it won't, won't need to. Um, what, what we actually need to focus on is for that group that have, uh, have gone on to that payment pause, how do we help them at that, the end of that pause um, whether that be to come up with a new payment arrangement or a, um, a different term, for example, a different contract, so they can get back to some level of normality post that pause. Tim? Yeah, obviously it's very prominent um, for all of us, just promoting um, hardship options, uh, both to encourage people to um, you know, proactively call in, um, or uh, in terms of sort of scripting and uh, access to that information through the, the regular uh, collections and, and customer assist activity. Um, I think like everybody, we've seen a dramatic increase in our hardship volumes. Um, but in many cases, it's actually people uh, who look like they're getting on the front foot. They're not, not coming from that uh, delinquent pool, but they're coming from customers that uh, have got a, a good history and have probably been impacted by um, uh, you know, COVID hopefully in, in the short term, but uh, as um, Joanne says, it may well be that uh, they'll 
sort of come around again at the back end and, and that uh, assessment uh, at the back end of the hardship period is important. Um, I know part of um, some of the prep for this, we're talking about, uh, you know, lessons learned and how things have changed. And I think um, collections or um, you know, debt recovery is an area that's changed quite significantly. I think if you go back sort of five to 10 years, it was more about, you know, big stick pay up or else. Uh, whereas now I think it's much more about um, understanding that most customers have got the right intention. There's probably good reasons why they've got uh, their circumstances have changed and, uh, you know, how do you kind of help them? And, and I think that goes hand in hand with the, um, how the sort of whole hardship function has evolved over the last sort of three to five years. Um, so yeah, but I, I guess that philosophy just, uh, um, even though people are missing payments, um, work with them. Um, how can you actually help them? Because most people do want to solve their own problems. Uh, yeah, and on that, David, I just like to add, you know, not, not everybody lends into prime, prime sectors. So the key thing here is to really know the part of the market that you're in. So people talk about stress testing their portfolios. Right now, I'd be stress testing your capacity to ramp up collections activity fast. So as the data starts to come through, um, if there's a bit more stress in society with unemployment rates and people having less money, uh, you really need to make sure that you've got the ability and you've thought it through how you, you can ramp up your front end collection activity. By the time it gets towards the back end of your portfolio, it's going to be too late by then. Um, so you, you really need to be doing that now. Um, a couple of questions that I'll bundle from Stuart Stoyan. Uh, one is a cheeky question. Why is Australian credit so heavily dominated for, by people from the UK? You don't need to answer yeah, why, that. Why is that? <laughs> um, this one's to, to Tim. Um, payment holidays are great for helping through the immediate crisis. Can you expand on your concerns regarding the three to six month time frame when people come off arrangements? Expand on my concerns. Yeah, it's more, uh, you know, based on experience. And uh, I, I can think of a, uh, a very specific discussion I had with industry colleagues in, in the past around um, approaches to some of the, I think it's one of the bushfire crises. And uh, so it wasn't uh, uh, about sort of self-interest from a lender perspective. I mean, sure, that's, uh, that, that's important, but it was actually from a, a customer perspective as well. Um, actually being in that rhythm of still paying something, even if it's a, a much smaller amount than a regular payment, um, produces a very distinct result at the end of the period than uh, when it's sort of out of mind and they haven't had to pay that and they get out of the routine or the rhythm or they're perhaps paying um, other debts as a, as a consequence. Um, so uh, certainly, you know, personal experience, uh, of my perspective is it benefits the lender, but it actually benefits uh, the consumer as well when um, they're still uh, in their mind maintaining that sort of behaviour and, and the need that that um, is a debt that they're going to have to maintain payments on in the future. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. This is a big one. Uh, so I'm just going to throw it out there. Um, and if you want to have a, a swing at it, please feel free. Do you see this recession evolving into a longer term depression, even if we manage the health crisis with a vaccine? As a risk manager, how would you view your longer term strategies to lend given so much volatility, that's from an anonymous t attendee. That's a big one. Anyone got any thoughts? Yeah, well, I've successfully forecast nine of the last six recessions. I mean, you know, forecasting where that's going to go, you know, is a, is, a, is a tough question. So it's really about scenario planning. Um, if you're in, if you're uh, a little bit different in SME, Jackie can speak with more authority there, but certainly in retail, you know, unemployment's really the key. And if we start to see the numbers really skyrocket um, in unemployment, uh, which feeds itself into consumer confidence, uh, that can be a tough hole to get out of. And if the government loses appetite over, over a longer period of time around its assistance, then you just have to recalibrate your business. I mean, people can't borrow because you, you can't do a proper assessment if they don't have jobs and don't have income. So you, you, you have to focus through it. So I would suggest that it's not about forecasting whether it will be a depression or not, is you have to just run your scenarios and work out what they will mean for your business uh, and make your calls. Yeah, David, and I'd, I'd just add to that. It, it, it's not much different in SME lending. You know, you, you do your scenarios based on, is this going to be a V-shaped recovery, a U-shaped recovery, L-shaped, well, whatever you want to put about it um, and work, 
work through that. It is really hard to to assess how long this will this the impacts of this will go on. I think the fact that we are starting to see some green shoots come through now, a level of positivity coming out of some of our customers in particular, who say initially came to us to say, I need some repayment assistance, but now they're saying, I think I'm okay, I wanna go back to making, making repayments. Um, I think the thing will be how long the lockdown and how long businesses are in hibernation for will be a determinant. And um, I think, you know, Australia, whilst is an island and um, in some ways can be immune from some of the bigger impacts, we are part of, you know, globalisation has kicked in and this is probably brought it home for us um, that, you know, we, we aren't just an island when it comes to things, things yeah. like this. So I think dangerous to predict, agree with Michael, do your scenarios and be, be ready for... Um, you know, the different, the different outcomes. Right. Now, I'm conscious we're coming up to time. I want to finish off with this last question and maybe 30 seconds, if you can, for each of you. It was submitted by Adam Bruce, um, pre-submitted. So Adam's from Alula. What's the number one new thing you want to do during this downturn compared to what you've perhaps done historically? Jack? Ah, that's a hard, that's a hard question. What's the number one number one new thing um i'd probably say stay positive um you, you know this i think we'll all come through this we'll we'll all learn something from it i think accepting the world will be different post this um you know this this is a tough environment we're all sitting at home in different different places working much more in isolation so i i think for this stay positive not overreact um you know get the facts um, analyze the situation um, and have a number of responses ready. Right. Joanne? Um, for me, I think it's really um, around just know your portfolio. So take the time to really understand and analyze and then back yourself. Um, so, you know, make a decision and stand by that decision and trust your gut feeling and back yourself. Right. Mike? Yeah, I think um, certainly a, a new thing for me is like for the last time, like the technology and what it allows us to do in society is fundamentally different to back then. You know, we're all doing this uh, in terms of, uh, you know, video conferencing, the switch to online shopping, digital payments. Um, this is going to have a profound impact, I think, post, post this. It'll change behaviours and structures. So it, it really says that, you know, you really need to be close to who your consumer are, consumers are and work out where they're going and see how you can uh, get on board and help with that. And we've already done a little bit of that work already and, and, and looking to adjust our, our offerings accordingly. Awesome, thanks Matt. And Tim? Uh, yeah, this sounds a bit boring, uh, but probably just uh, make sure you use it as a prompt to refocus back on the basics. So, you know, we all like the idea of, you know, all these sexy things like machine learning and all, and all that good stuff. But I don't think any of us would uh, say we've got our data in, in order. Uh, if you could get to that utopian position where you've got all the data you want, it's um, well managed, you're confident, it's uh, got all the right controls, um, and that allows you to, you know, then your modeling becomes easy <laughs> and, and efficient and your, and your reporting. And uh, uh, so to me, it's taking some of these opportunities to, just to get the basics right. And I think that's what's, where organizations are going to get found out now. Uh, some of that basic stuff around your data, your mon monitoring, your reporting, your, your base uh, checks and balances on your models. Uh, those that haven't sort of got that right or are not in a position uh, with what they've developed to really be monitoring, and, and we're literally doing it on a, on a daily basis, uh, are going to get found out. So it's just getting it, using it as an opportunity to fix some of those foundational items. Yeah, well said. Uh, we are at time. Um, I, I want to thank uh, the panellists for their uh, generous um, time today and the transparency and willingness to, to share. Um, I wish each and every one of your organisations the best over the coming um, few months as we emerge from hopefully the worst of, of what's going on at the moment. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, to FinTech Australia um, and thank you most importantly for um, participating today as the audience. This um, session will be recorded or it has been recorded and will be made available uh, after the event. So 
um, please um, don't hesitate to let other people know um, who've uh, not been able to join today. So on that note, Rahan, I'll hand back to you and, and thank you very much. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you, panelists, for your insights. And of course, thank you, attendees, for making the time for this. Um, stay safe. And yeah, I'll be ending the call. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Stay Thanks. safe out there. Bye-bye.